Job 14. Job 14, if you will. If you get that one, you can work on those. <clears throat> All right, we're going to continue looking at uh, what the, compo- the, the compartments, the components that make up you. And uh, we've been looking at uh, several, we, we just spent some time, I, I had an email this past week, actually it was a week and a half ago now, asking why we're doing what we're doing and looking at things. And when the um, events back a couple a uh, month or so ago with uh, Lisa and the kids and David and everything, I, I told you then that we're in uncharted waters a little bit for me and for us because when things like that tragedy happen, they always happen to someone else. And rather, they didn't. They happened to us here. And as I was begin to thinking about, we had talked about how you are made and the spirit, soul, and body and how you're designed to think and so forth. But I got to looking into it and going, okay, why in the world was such a horrific decision made? You know, you begin to so get a little bit. So we, that's why we're on the road we're on, just to understand you. Because you need to understand how God designed you, how he created you to function, how he created each of these three components in you to work, because then that way you can then have an objective understanding to fix when things aren't working right. Okay? You, you got Job 14, right? We're, we're, we're soon departed from the notes already. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 with me. Just, just hold on to Job. I just, folks, the Apostle Paul says that the Spirit worked, strengthened the inner man, Ephesians 3, that you're able to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, okay? Go to, go to 1 Corinthians 3. I can talk to you about other passages. At least th- that back corner over there, I don't think I can. Three rows from the end, okay? But see, the thing is, is when, when Paul says that you're able to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes all understanding, when he says that, then that means you can know some of this stuff. Okay, and the, the interesting thing is, is most of us have never thought about knowing how you're made up. You, you've been functioning this way all your life. Since the moment you were conceived, you were functioning this way. When the, you got out of the, when you came out of mom, <laughs> and you screamed and they smacked your butt and all that good stuff, you guys, you've been breathing, drink, eating, talking, thinking this way the whole time and never thought about God created you to do that and be that way. And the reason we're looking at it is so you have an objective, outside of you, standard picture so that when things aren't working right in your life, you can say, wait a minute, I need to stop the flow and I need to adjust the flow. And I need to get the flow going back the right way. 1 Corinthians 3, I had you look there. Look at verse number 9, if you will. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So do you think there's a foundation being laid, and we're to build on that foundation? you see that? I think so. So then what, do I, what am I to be building on the foundation? Verse 12. Now if any man build upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if it abides, you get a reward, and if it doesn't, you suffer a loss. But notice something in verse 12. What am I building on the foundation? There's some things I can know how to, what am I building? Gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. You, you, you see that. So now what I got to figure out is what is gold, silver, and precious stones, right? Well, you do a little Bible study, and what do you find out? It's wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, isn't it? Right? Well, what would be wood, hay, and stubble? There's the activity, that's the religious activity. The activities of your flesh, of your old sin nature right there. The the righteous moral stuff. But notice how the verse says you're going to build those six categories on your foundation. Do you see that? What day, then it says that day shall make them all manifest. See that? 
There's going to be a day out there in the future called the judgment seat of Christ that's going to do what? Judge out what you built on your foundation. We've studied this out. Doesn't that help you to know now in time to make sure of what I am building on my foundation? Because doesn't verse 12 tell you what the judgment is going to be specifically targeted at? Do you see that? So now I know that if I'm over here building my wood, hay, and stubble stuff, works of the flesh, religious activity, what's going to happen to that? It's going to be burned. But if I'm over here in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, what's going to happen with that? It'll stay. So then when I look at my life and what I'm doing, do I not now have an objective point of view outside of myself of what I should be doing? Isn't that amazing? That's what we're doing with the you, Job 14. Because now what can I do? Now I know that when I meet the Lord in the air and I go into the judgment seat of Christ, I know as a member of the body of Christ what He's going to be looking at. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, he talks about we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to be held accountable for the things that are done in this body, whether they be good or bad. The in, the inner man, good or bad. I know something then, don't I? I know that when I wake up in the morning, I have the ability to make a decision in my head and in in who I am in Christ to function properly, to walk properly, to build up into my inner man gold, silver, and precious stones. But I also know what? I'm going to have the wood, hay, and stubble too. So when I have the wood, hay, and stubble, what do I do then? I stop. That's pretty simple. Folks, this stuff is not difficult. You and I take the simplicity of Christ and make it difficult. We're going to look today at the body. i got to get this up here real quick. We talked about the spirit. Okay? And because we're going to make our, the issue of our body, we make it more difficult than Scripture says. And we do it because we don't believe the verse. And I say it that way to every one of you in here because you don't believe the verse. You don't. You quote it to me, you quote it to yourself. But you don't believe the verse. Your spirit is your mind. We looked at that. That's where your thinking happens. You have your memory system. You have your vocabulary system. You store up the sound doctrine, which becomes your norms and standards that live in your life. You have the Word of God out here that comes in. We communicate with God in our spirit. We communicate with each other in our spirit. This is where this all happens. We talked last time about your soul. This is you. We talked about your heart, remember? This is your mentality. Your heart, by the way, you could call it the mind of your soul if you needed to have mind in there again. Okay, But Paul doesn't say that. Paul calls it your hearts and minds. He separates them out a little because this is your, yeah, your heart. Inside of your heart, you have your will or volition. Okay, Then you have your conscience, and then you have your emotions, all right? Your heart, by the way, what connects the spirit to the soul is the mind issue. That's the connecting. Now you have your body, and that's what we're going to talk about today, as quickly as you can turn the pages. Your body, this is your inner man, this is your outer man, okay? We good? I'll review. No? Yes? Okay, good. You hear the Word of God, comes into your thinking process, develops into that edification process of the sound doctrine, gets built up inside of you. By the way, if you've got the Word, you can also have human viewpoint. If you ever see me put HV up, that's human viewpoint. Okay? That comes in here, gets stored up into your memory system, into your thinking system, into your vocabulary system. How many of you have to understand that on the third strike, the guy is out? Any, anybody don't understand that? Okay. Depends on what they're playing. Okay. 
Always one in the crowd, okay? But see, the thing is, is we all understand that what? That terminology, don't we? Okay? Tic-tac-toe is what? Three in a row, right? We understand that terminology because we've had it exposed to us. We brought it into our thinking, into our memory system, into our thinking system. The heart reaches over, grabs that information and says, three strikes and you're out. The will says, yep, that's right. The conscience says, yep, that's what we're going to do. The emotions say, yep, that's what we're going to do. The conscience looks over at your body and says, that activity of three strikes and you're out and you walking back to the dugout is consistent with what we understand. That's a good thing. The emotions are what then cause the body to go to work, to walk back to the dugout because you are out. So then your body, you got Job 14. You've had it for a while, haven't you? That's a good thing. Look at verse number 22 with me. But his flesh, what's the next two words? Upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. That's an interesting verse. That verse says the flesh upon him. So the body becomes the vehicle, doesn't it? It's the vehicle that's toting the inner man. Flesh. Notice the terms. you got to pay attention to terms today. Flesh. This thing right here, what does it have? That, what does that verse say it has? It has what? It has emotion. The emotion called pain, doesn't it? So these emotions are talking to that emotion. The soul says it does what? It mourns. Where do you mourn? It's an emotion, isn't it? So your body has, is a vehicle... It's emotions. By the way, the conscience are evaluators. The emotions are responders. Your connection to the environment around you is in the vehicle. It's in your body. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you're in the presence of the Lord, what environment are you in? You're in a godly presence, aren't you? But 2 Corinthians 5 also tells you that you're naked. You don't have a body yet. This guy's laying in the grave. This guy, your soul, he's up there in the presence of the Lord. Okay? What do I need to go to work in the heavenly places? I need a new body. Now Now I can have an impact. I can have a connection to the heavenly places. Right now we have one here on the earth, one day out there in the heavenly places. The body has resources. We have how many senses? Five senses. We have systems, do we not? If you're if you have your hand out from a couple weeks ago, there's a we have touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing. We have a nervous system, a a respiratory system, a uh, muscular system, muscular system, circulatory, and digestive. That's what you keep reading for reading too fast. What do you have? You have systems. You have resources. You have emotions. They're all part of the body. And that's what we're going to look at. Flip back with me real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Because I want you to see something just real quick here about something, about your soul and your body. The connection between your spirit and your soul is the mind. The connection between the soul and the body is is the emotions. All right? The proper flow. A minute ago I was talking about getting the flow right. The flow is from the Word of God into your spirit, into your soul, worked out through your body, which will end up equaling out to the good, the good works that we should be about. Okay? You see this? You, you, i got to make sure you see it. Because yeah. we're going to talk about the body here now, 2 Corinthians 12. And you, if, you, if you're shady in what, how this is to work, you'll never understand what I'm about. I'm going to tell you. You'll think I'm telling you something that I'm not telling you. Because I'm probably telling you something I'm not telling you. 2 Corinthians 12. Look, if you will, real quick to verse 2. Paul talking here about himself. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the what? The body I cannot tell, God, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up in the third heaven. 
And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, God cannot tell. I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise. When Paul was stoned to death in Acts, more than likely, he, this is where this happens. But notice what Paul says. When Paul is stoned, which that event is Acts 14, when Paul is stoned, when the guy's doing the stoning, what are they looking at? His body, the physical deal. But what does Paul say when he got to the third heaven? What does he say? Whether in the body or out of the body, what? I cannot tell. That tells you about one about the environment of heaven is going to be so familiar to you that it's like moving from this to that. It will not be a shock to your system, number one. But number two, that soul has a bodily shape. And you know what it has? Two arms, two legs, a head, a mind. Systems, it's got everything. You see that? So when we talk about body here, we're going to begin to talk about some things. Come over with me to Romans 6. That when we started, I did a thing about the spirit and the soul in the Old Testament, how you have to be careful. Some of that comes in with the body and the soul here. But I'm going to leave you to have that study on your own because I want to look at some things here that when we begin to... Talk about your body. It is probably the hardest of these components to deal with because Paul deals with it in several different aspects. One, your physical body, but then two, the old sin nature. The issue there of the old sin nature, which is that condition of your unsaved condition. Now, we're talking about saved people here. We'll do unsaved people next time, maybe, if we have the time. But when Paul talks about that, he talks about the body of Christ. So now he's not talking about you or saved or unsaved. He's talking about the agency. So you have to be very careful. There you go. Okay? You have to be very careful when you look at that issue of body and of flesh. Okay? It's called off. Okay, look at Romans 6 and look at verse 6 with me. At least it's not the ball game. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're winning and they're losing. Or you're losing and we're winning. I don't know. Look at Romans 6 and verse number 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Do you see that? Okay. Notice the note, Romans 6, 6. Notice the, the different terminologies that Paul is throwing at here. First he says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, see that? There's a body of sin, there's an old man, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, you, you, There's three things going on in that verse. But yet he's talking about only just a couple things. But he's using terminology that is describing a spiritual condition as well then as a physical condition. All right? Watch the old man. If I'm crucified, if that old man is crucified, the old man, it just, that, that, that term, the old sin nature, I would say it sometimes like, or you'll hear it that way, that term is describing your unsaved condition. When you are lost on your way to hell, where your spirit is dead, your soul is darkened, and your body is depraved. When you're in that condition, that is the old man. Okay? How do I know that? Look at verse 6. What does it say about the old man? It's been what? Well, wait a minute. Are you dead or are you living? Hello? Are you breathing? We got to think a joke at the work that when they go hire people, they just write, slide a mirror up underneath their nose, make sure they're breathing. Because we got some, we got some real winners. Okay? But see, the thing is, is when he says the old man is crucified, he's not talking about you physically dying, is he? Because you're still sitting here breathing. 
but what is your standing? What's your status here? He's dead. See that? That, uh, that, that the body of sin. See that body of sin? Old man and body of sin have been what? Connected, haven't they? As being what? Dead. Do, do you see the verse? Look, don't look at me. Look at the verse. That the body of sin might be what? How you destroy something? You crucify it. You deal with it. It's done. See? That we should not henceforth serve what? Now we're talking about what you're going to do in your walk. aren't you? When this guy, see that? So when we talk about this stuff, you got to be very careful. Guess what? Context is going to end up being king at every turn. And if you know me long enough, you know that's the case. Because what is the context of Romans 6.6? 6? It's the fact that your identity now is not in your old sin nature, your old man. It's rather in who you are now in Christ. And the fact is that you are dead to sin. You are dead to the control and the constraints and the running of sin in your life. How can that be? Because what did Christ do at Calvary? He crucified the old man. He dealt with that old sin nature and he annihilated it. So when you come down to verse 14, when he says we're not under sin, that's the case. Do you see? Why is that the case? Well, because in verse 10, 11, and 12, and 13, he's reckoned out. See, verse 14's got verses in front of it, doesn't it? Let's park here for a minute. Look at verse, well, we read verse 6. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. See how death is not even is, is out of the equation any longer. But yet your physical body does what? It'll die eventually. Either with help or without help. For verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, that's a verse you don't believe. Every one of you in this room that says, I can't stop sinning, don't believe that verse right there. You don't. People listening to my voice that will not and have struggle and have this and that, don't believe that verse. And if you say, yes, I do, you are a liar. Because what does that verse tell you? What does it tell you? It tells you that you are free, you are dead indeed unto sin. That's what that verse tells you. Notice it didn't tell you you lost your sin nature. Notice it doesn't say that. Notice it doesn't say you're never going to have problems again. It doesn't say, no, you're not going to struggle with this or that. You see that? That means what? You are going to? But what does it mean? Your identity and who you are in Christ is that you are dead to that. That sin does not control your life any longer. And the only reason that it does is because you have made a decision of your will to allow it to control you. Because you don't believe what the Word of God has been put into you to believe. Man. Don't, folks, believe me, I struggle with this just as much, if not more, than you. I'm preaching to me way before I preach to any of you. And I know for a fact, verse 11 does work. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your... Oh, now where are we at? Now we're back over here in this vehicle guy doing what? Moving it on out, aren't we? Yeah. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto what? You don't let this vehicle guy run the show. But rather do what? But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but you are under grace. What's controlling this guy? There's a little thing over there going to talk about the law. Romans 7. When I find a law in my flesh, I can't do it. Da, da, da. Hey, folks, this guy right here wants to run the show. 
Paul says your identity and who you are in Christ is that you are free from the dominion of sin. Not because there's a law, because the law with the law comes the knowledge of sin, and the, and the law gets its strength in the flesh, the verses say, but rather because of God's grace, He is what? Set you free. Folks, you got to believe Romans 6 or you will struggle with sin all the time in your life. 99% of grace believers never get out of the first five chapters of the book of Romans. I'd hope you'd be in the 1% that do. Because when you do, you know what you really quickly do? You, have, you become to have a different perspective on life. Not that you're going to be perfect and never mess up because you're going to flat do that. Just ask your spouse if you're married or if you're kids, if you have kids, okay? But when you do, what then do you do about it and how do you handle it? See, that's, the next, that's seven and eight. But you have to understand when we start talking here about the body and stuff, the old man is a description of the unsaved condition and folks, you are dead to that body of sin. He's crucified that. He's taken that out of the way. Come over with me to Ephesians 4. Now, we're going to run verses, okay? Because when you start talking about this, what did I tell you? Ephesians 4. I want you to see several different terms, and I want you to understand that when we get over here talking about the body and the physical and then the spiritual issues, you have a decision to make. And the choice is yours. Actually, we didn't keep reading down in Romans 6, but Romans 6 is clear. You have a choice. Romans 6.23, we quote it all the time in dealing with unsaved people, for the wages of sin is what? When you let sin reign and rule the show, you know what you have? You have spiritual death. That's what happened to Adam and Eve, was spiritual death. But the gift of God is what? God's grace says, you're not under sin, you're not under the law. I killed it, I crucified it, I took care of that issue for you. And you need to now go live for me. Romans 4. Notice verse number 4. There is one body and one spirit. You see the one body there? Who's he talking about there? Ephesians 4 verse 4. Who's he talking about the one body there? Is it the body, your physical thing, or is it the body of Christ? The body of Christ. Look down at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Pretty simple there, huh? Come over to Colossians chapter 2. Paul, again, he's going to use some different terminologies here. He's using similar terminology with different focus points. Colossians 2 verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. That operation, we'll talk about it maybe next time. That operation of God when God, when you say, I trust, when you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and He became your Savior, Savior, the Holy Spirit goes to work. And one of the mechanisms and one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is He comes in and He literally, circumcision is the cutting away of the flesh. He cuts you away from the bondage of the body of sins of the flesh. That's Romans 6 6. See, so when he talks here about the body of the sins of the flesh, he's talking about that unsaved spiritual condition has now been what? That connection to Adam has now been severed. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4. I tried to keep these in order, but I didn't work right now, but we'll get there. 2 Corinthians 4. And look at verse 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 and verse number 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our what? So then what body is he talking about at the end of 10? The mortal flesh. That's this thing. As you and I go day by day in our lives, as we go to our jobs, as we deal with with our loved ones, our family, our friends, as we do that, you know what they are to see? They are to see the life of Christ, aren't they? That means I've made a decision to put this guy in his proper place and follow the sound doctrine and get the flow right. 
And if the body's running the show, then the flow is wrong. And what do I need to do? Objectively, what can I then do? Stop. Reverse the flow. Okay. Your mortal flesh. Flip back with me to Psalms 139. Psalms is before Proverbs. 139 is toward the end of the book. Read a verse that we all kind of quote about our physical body. So we have our physical body, our mortal flesh. That's the issue of what holds everything together. (laughs) That holds the systems in place. It carries your soul and your spirit around. It moves you from one joint to the next. It moves you from here to there. Hebrews 4, verse number 12, calls it the joints and the marrow, you know, the discerning, okay? That's what we're talking about now. Psalms 139, verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Notice that issue about fearfully and wonderfully made. Folks, your body is. You know, when God made you, He he made you to operate. Come back to 1 Corinthians 12. He made you to operate in the function so perfectly, so right on that it's just unreal. You cut yourself and what happens? You heal instantly. Well, not instantly, but well, <laughs> over time for some of us. But you do heal, don't you? You might have a scar, you might not, but you heal. 1 Corinthians 12, this whole section here is about the spiritual gifts. I just want you to see the allure, the allure to the body, the physical body, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. Verse 15, if the foot, verse 16, if the ear. Well, verse 15, for if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is it therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? You, you, you see, I and mean, you just keep reading down through that. You, you see the, the Paul using the diversification of the body of Christ, and he says, you know what? You know how you can understand that? Just look at your mortal flesh, your body, your physical body. Because what do you begin to see? You begin to see all these pieces, don't you? And you begin to see this and that. My glasses do not sit straight on my head. Come back to chapter 1. The reason is, is one ear is taller than the other ear. So when they say, oh, you got your ears lowered, I no, <laughs> it's crooked, you know. <laughs> I got one lower than the other one, right? So when you talk about the body, that's what we're, physical body, we're talking about this guy this, that's toting you around. 1 Corinthians 1, and notice, if you will, verse 26. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen, well, that's not it. That's in, I mean verse 26. I was reading verse 27. For ye see your calling, brethren, not many wise, not many, uh, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You see that after the flesh? He's talking about this, you and I. We're flesh, okay? Come back to chapter 13. I just want you to see some of this. 1 Corinthians. I'm going to try to stay in the order of of Paul's books here. Okay? 13, verse number 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity profit me not. He's giving his what to be burned? That's the physical body. Okay? This thing. All right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 10. We just read it a minute ago about our our bodies, our mortal flesh. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Verse 11, he calls it the the mortal flesh, but it's his life, where? In our body. It's Galatians (laughs) 2.20. It's his life living out in our bodies, which... When you think about the flow, where, where, where is that? Well, first we have to learn about what His life is, don't we? So we go to the Word of God, we bring that in, we put it into the system. The heart reaches over and says, you know what? We need to understand what this is because we're trying to figure out how to live our lives. 
And that verse says that we're to live our life and manifest His life. So His life is sitting in here. We get it. We go, okay, we're going to do it now. The will says, yep, that's what we're going to do. The will, the heart tells the emotions. You go tell the body, the vehicle, to let's get going because this is what we're going to do. We're going to be living His life over here. That's the goal. The conscience looks over and says, yep, it's matching what we decided to do, and it's matching the, the norms and standards. So we're good. Success. Way to go. But when you get over here and this guy says, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. What do you mean I got to go to church and can't watch the football game? We're talking about it. That guy right there, remember we talked a couple weeks ago about emotional pain and the emotions and so forth? This guy here, he revolts out and says, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to stay home and watch football game. He then comes back here to these guys, because that's where we communicate with each other. That's the link. And he says, you tell them, forget it, we're staying home. And oh, by the way, I'm sitting, I've been duct taped to the chair. You can't take me. Nah, 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 boo, boo. I'm locked in the closet. I've locked the door, shut the door, locked it. I'm talking about physically, in the, lock the door. Some of you have pitched that kind of fit before. Now what's happened? The flow went the wrong way, didn't it? Quick. See? Where did it start? It started in your emotions of your body being not under the control of your emotions and your spirit and your soul and all that. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Notice, if you will, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See that? He's talking about the physical body, isn't he? We're home. We're at home right here, right now. And but yet we'd rather be in our real home, which is in heavenly places. Galatians 6. This one always interested me. Galatians 6 and verse 17. Galatians 6, verse 17. Paul says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Boy, you see that? Paul says, I could take my shirt off and show you the marks. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. 2 Corinthians 11. I've been on perils. I've been robbed. I've been beaten. I've been left for dead. Could you imagine being stoned? And what it would look like physically on you? I've had my head bashed in. I bear, but why did he have all that happen to him? Because he had a word of God in his system that he was going to go and live life and manifest the life of Christ. That's why he says over there in Philippians 1, I'm going to magnify his life in my body, the physical thing. Philippians 3, he says he's going to change our vile body. Folks, your body is vile. The physical body is vile. Go a week or two without taking a shower. B-O, right? I've done it too. We've done it camping. Real quick, you're looking for a shower or to get accidentally, purposely pushed into the lake. <laughs> well, whoops. <laughs> Throw a bar quick. Why? It's vile. Don't brush your teeth for a while and see what happens to your gums and your stuff. It's vile. You know why it is, though? It's a connection to Adam. It's called sin, and it's corruptive, and it's degenerative. So when we talk about body here, come over with me back to 1 Corinthians 15. That's usually sometimes what Paul is talking about. But most of the time, when he talks about body, he's talking about either the, the body of Christ, the agency, or he's talking about your physical body. But then there's the term flesh. And this is where flesh comes in where you have to be very careful with. Because you can talk about flesh. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 30. Uh, where to go? Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, 
But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are celestial, what? Do you see how he changed from flesh to bodies? Now, what kind of flesh of men are there? They're body flesh. See how, but see how he's using flesh? And see, every time you and I would ever use the word flesh, what are we thinking about? That old sin nature, and it's just flesh. He's walking in his flesh. Well, no kidding. Where else is he going to walk? See? You got, so you've got to be very careful with this. Look over at 1 uh, 2 Corinthians 10. By the way, verse 40 there about the bodies, that helps you understand what flesh he's talking about. But look at 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Isn't that interesting? What does Ephesians 6, 12 tell us? Our battle is not with what? Flesh and blood. It's with spiritual wickedness, right? What is 10, 3 saying? Man, we walk around in the flesh, don't we? And you know what my battle is? It isn't with other flesh. It isn't with you. That's, my battle isn't with you. My battle is with the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. My battle with you is you're not operating here. You're operating there in human viewpoint. That's what Galatians 6.1 is all about when he talks about ye which are spiritual, restore such a one that's overtaken and fault. The spiritual isn't you know more verses than me. That's not being spiritual. That's actually being pretty ignorant pretty selfish. Being spiritual is, hey, what's functioning? What's controlling the situation? Which way is the flow going? Well, if I'm overtaken in a fault, which way is my flow going? Wrong way, isn't it? So the guys with the flow going the right way, what do they do? They come with the Word of God and do what? Begin the issue of restoration. You follow that? But notice how Paul uses flesh to talk about your physical body and to walk around in. So you got to be careful when you start yakking about the flesh. Come over with me to Galatians 1. Because sometimes it's not talking about that old sin nature and the old man guy and all that other stuff that you're trying to pawn off an excuse of why you messed up. Folks, you know why you messed up? It's called sin. But it's also called not sin because you're not thinking properly. And you just got over there with, you got your mind all off balance and where you should be. And you did some things and so you want to you wanna justify it and say, well, I'm just my flesh. Ah, be very careful when you say that. Look at verse Galatians 1, look at verse 16. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Here again, who's that? That's people. It's the people back up that he's been persecuting and what they've been arguing with him about. You see that? Chapter 4 of Galatians. Galatians 4. And verse 13. Galatians 4. It's not the right verse. Yep, Galatians 4.13. Ye know how through in the infirmities of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first. Infirmities of what? But Paul was sick when he went up there and talked to those folks. He had eye problems. He had difficulties in the flesh, didn't he? Colossians chapter number 2, interesting little verse here. Verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them that are at Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Isn't that interesting? How Paul will use flesh to talk about the physical meeting, the physical body here. See that? Verse 5. For I, though I be absent in, in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Boy, he sure enough drew that out. Colossians 3, verse 22. 322. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Look at that. Where's your boss at? Is he some spiritual being dude over here you got to deal with? No, he's a flesh man just like you are. He's a dirt man just like you are. But notice how Paul 
using the term flesh is making some references here to body, this, the vehicle. But the flesh, come back to Romans 6 here now. The flesh is also used, and it's almost always used, and again, context tell, told us everything that that word flesh was talking about the body, right? right. Romans 6, again, verse 6 here. You also have to understand that he's, that he's using the word, he will use the word flesh, and for the majority of the time, it is referring to the issue of your old man. And it's referring to the old sin nature that we have inherited from Adam. You got Romans 6? Turn back to chapter 5 and look at verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. How did sin get introduced into humanity? By Adam. When you were born, you were born with a sin nature. That's, there's no other way. You, there, you were never born without it. Okay? And the reason is, is because Adam and Eve made Seth in their image. All right? So you and I are made in the image of Adam, Seth. Okay, so we have what? Sin. It's there. It's referred by Paul in Romans 6, verse 6, as the old man and the body of sin and, and, and different things along, and, and flesh as well. If you look there at verse number 12, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 6, he talks about knowing that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that we henceforth we should not serve sin. So obviously, we're talking about something that is not our physical this guy. We're talking about something that's inside of us that, that is that connection to Adam that has been severed, that has been cut away. So our status and our relationship to the old sin nature has been dealt with and has been crucified. We've been liberated from it. If you look down at verse 19, by the way, verse 12, I, I said the stuff just a minute ago uh, when we look through here in 11, 12, and 13, and verse 14, if you look at verse 15, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether it is of sin unto death. What kind of death would that would sin be le leading you to? It's a spiritual death. It's a functional death. Okay? It's a spiritual death as well. Spiritual death and functional death are two different deaths. <laughs> Spiritually, you're going to die if you're not in Christ. Here, it's a functional death. You're not functioning as who you are in Christ. You're not operating appropriately, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. Folks, what are you? Believe the verse, please. You're free from sin. You're free from the dominion and the control of sin and that old sin nature is to have in your life. You've been freed from that. You become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your what? Now, isn't that interesting? He just told you you're free, but then he's going to talk about an infirmity in the flesh. That infirmity in the flesh, as ye have yielded your members' servants un, uh, to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield. That infirmity in the flesh is the war that's going on between your old man and your new man. See? And he notice how he calls it flesh. That's my point. And he says, man, in, your, in that spiritual condition that you were back there connected to Adam, that connection has been severed. And your now connection is to the new Adam and who you are in Christ. Don't live under that guy. You come over here and live under who you are. But all the way, that guy's still there, though, by the way. And you're going to struggle. And you have a decision in who you're going to choose to serve. I hope you noticed that as we read through. That's why I did that. See? Because you have a choice in the matter. You can choose to serve sin or you can choose to serve righteousness. How do I do that? I get the flow going the right way. Or I get the flow going the wrong way. 
chapter 7. You guys, you guys catching what's going on here? Chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of what? So if you're in the flesh, the flesh here, what's he talking about? This guy, the body guy, or the spiritual condition, that old sin nature? The spiritual condition. See that? Because you, you were always in the flesh, weren't you? But what was going on in the flesh when you were in the flesh? The motions of sin. See? Which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The flesh, the motion of sin, that spiritual condition. What is, what's this guy wanting to generate in you? E, look at that. The motions of sin. Do you see emotion in there? Motion? What's he doing? He's got a satanically desi, devi, um, designed emotional system to bring you to, not to success, to good works, but to bondage that you ain't winning and you'll never win. And oh, by the way, God doesn't want you to win. <laughs> yeah, liar, liar, pants on fire. What's he doing? That's over here. He's dragging, he's going to drag you the wrong way, isn't he? And Paul says, you're dead to that guy. Verse 18, 718. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Boy, look at that struggle. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That isn't a cry for the rapture. That's a cry to get this guy under control and these guys can flourish and I can get my flow going the right way. And it, that's what's going on here. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. What made you free? Christ, the life, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Folks, when you're unsaved and your spirit is darkened and your soul is, or your spirit is dead and your soul is darkened and the glorious light of the gospel shines in there and all of a sudden you trusted Calvary and you become alive to God and, your, and His life goes to work, then this guy changes completely. You're circumcised away from Him. Verse 4, verse 3, for, the, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, that old sin nature, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You want to fulfill the righteousness of the law, you know where you have to do it? What's the verse tell you? In the flesh or in the Spirit? Only in the Spirit. Because your flesh is going to run the thing the wrong way. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Boy, it can't be any clearer than that. If you're operating over here in the motions of sin, emotion, and sin's running the show, you know what the emotions are going to do? When you have emotions, they, they, they are real, aren't they, to you? These emotions come in here and tell these emotions what to do. These emotions talk to the heart where the decision has been made and said, that, that isn't real, this is real. Emotions are dumb, they're stupid, they don't think, they're responders to. And then he comes in and says, you know what, yeah, I, I, I feel your pain. And then this guy goes, wait a minute, now you're going to be over here. So now what have you built into your norms and standards? You built in human viewpoint to your norms and standards. You follow that? Paul, Paul very, I'll keep reading eight here. Verse eight, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What flesh would that be? It can't be the body because you live in the body and we're to live out his life in our mortal bodies, aren't we? So if we're in the flesh, we can't please God. What flesh is that talking about? That's that old sin nature, isn't it? 
That's that guy that's running the show because you decided that you're going to let him. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man be have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You, I tell you what, folks, you better be careful how you throw around that word flesh. Paul says you are dead. Your flesh is dead. That old sin nature, that sin thing is gone. It's dealt with. You're free from its bondage and its control. Come over to 1 Corinthians 1. In verse 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 29. Interesting little verse here. That no flesh should glory in His presence. What flesh would that be? Because don't we, when we live the life, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we live for Christ and we do what Galatians 2.20 tells us and in our daily lives and we're living and we're manifesting His life and we've got our flow going on, boy, don't we bring glory and honor to God? Yeah, we do. So then what's He talking about here? He's talking about this guy. That old dirty, rotten rascal that wants to do what? Run the show. Chapter 5, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of, our Lord, of the Lord Jesus. The destruction of the flesh. So we're going to deliver him to Satan. <coughs> and we're going to hope somebody jumps him and mugs him and beats the tar out of him so he'll remember and know what to do right from now on. That ain't what he's talking about. What's he talking about? Hey, we're going to cut this guy loose from the fellowship so that he can get this guy back under control and get his thinking in the manner that it should be in. And the local assembly get their thinking in the manner it should be in because they didn't mourn. They weren't mournful of this guy's sin. They were promoting it. They were saying, see how loving and gracious we are? We've ignored his sin. Paul says, nuh-uh, nice try, guys. That sin's what crucified Christ. If it was the only one, it was one too many. He died, he died for it all. Get your thinking in the right order. <clears throat> we could go on and on. Look at Galatians 5. And folks, when he talks this stuff about your body, your body has resources, and one of its resources is that issue of, of it, it has these emotions that want to control things. And your job, and where the battle is, we'll talk next time about the war. And some of this stuff here in Galatians 5, next time a little more. But where the battle is and the war is, is who's running the show? Who's controlling this guy right there? The heart. Who's controlling the mind and the will and the, the thinking process? Who's controlling it? Well, it makes me feel good. That is an emotion of your body. Because it makes me feel good, then we're going to do this. But how about learn to do that the right way, so then at the end, what do you do? You feel good. That's what you're trying to get out over there, isn't it? Galatians 5, verse 1, just real quick. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So we have a liberty, right? We're free, right? Look at verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the, what? What flesh would that be? Don't say body. That's that guy. That's that old sin nature guy. I'm going to go out here and do what I want to do because I can do it. And there's nothing you can do to stop me. But rather we're to use our liberty to what? For by love serve one another. How do I serve somebody? i got to have the proper thinking process going on before I can ever get to the issue of loving somebody. Because this guy, if he's in control going that way, you know what? He don't like you. So he ain't going to love you. Oh, but Rick, we love you. No, you don't. No, you, if you were honest with yourself, you would not. You do not. Remember last week we talked about that heart, desperately wicked? <laughs> Come on now. But if you view me as who I am in Christ and you're thinking properly, then what can you say? 
I love you. And it'd be genuine and real. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Wow, look at that. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the... Boy, there's a conflict going on. We'll talk about this next time. Verse 18, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these... And he begins to lay in some of those things that are there to, to, to that the flesh resources. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. See that? Boy, th- believe that verse if you're going to believe anything. It's all done. It's all been taken care of. Chapter 6, verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Boy, you sow to that guy, you know what you're going to sow? Corruption. Do you lose your salvation? No. But you sure enough don't live a life that's worthy and well-pleasing to the Lord. you got a self-centered life that you're leading and you're living and you're just trying to do it because it makes you feel good, makes you look good, makes everybody want to be your friend. That's a wrong, uh uh-uh, that's wrong. That's going to be corruption because you know what's going to happen? When you do that, you're going to begin to set up a performance-based acceptance system with those people that you're trying to be you know, all in all to. And when they start failing you, then you're, then you're going to do what Colossians 3 tells you to put off, which is anger and wrath and bitterness and all those attitude sins that come out. The list here is physical sins. And the next thing you know, you know what they're going to look at you and they're going to say, man, if, you, if that's being a Christian, I don't want anything to do with that. And you just did it because you were trying to be a fulfilling that little flesh thing you got going on. But if you come, if you come at it the proper way, you're going to esteem others better than yourself, aren't you? You're going to have a oneness in your thinking. You're going to have a mind that doesn't say, woe is me, why, why, why? We were singing that song, why? You know what why is? That's the baby cry. Wah, wah. You know, babies cry. Wah. You know what they're saying? Why, why? <laughs> What'd you do? Why? Babies say why. Why? Hey, not, not the song. Don't get me wrong, okay? But you think, about, you think about that. Philippians, or Ephesians 2. I'm hurrying. Verse 3. Philippians 2, 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Do you see that fulfilling the desires and the lust and all that? Man, that flesh is at large and in control. Philippians 3. Here's religion for you. Philippians 3, Philippians 3, 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath thereof, he might, he might trust in the flesh, I more. See how the flesh all of a sudden now became about religion? Come over to Philemon 16. Philemon, let's close. It's time. Folks, when you read and talk about the flesh, you need to be very careful. Because one minute is talking about the physical body. One minute is talking about the, the, um, the old sin nature. Then you can begin to talk about other things. You need to be very careful. The majority of the time when Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about the fact that your identity, your status in the family of God right now is that you have been cut free of the dominion and the rule and the control of sin in your life. And the only reason why it's there in your life is because you chose it to be there. That is it. Well, Rick, that's not enough. You can't say that. Yes, I can, because that's what the verses say. And your problem is, is you're not believing the verses and you're taking it out on me because you don't want to stand there and be, a, be, be ye quick and be like men and say, you know what, I just choose to disobey the Word of God. You don't want to say that. I got it. I don't either some days. But grow up. Admit that's what it is. I do. Boy, I tell you what, when I pitch my little hissy fits, I know right where I am. I don't have anybody who has to say, oh, you know what? But when you judge yourselves, which is where the judging begins, you're to take the Word of God and, and match your own behavior with the Word of God. 
And the only way to have success in that is for you to believe the verse. And if you're not going to believe the verse, then don't come yell at me. You can't say this. You can't do that. Because that's what the verses say. Be very careful when you talk about the flesh. Most of the time, Paul's talking about that old sin nature and what's going on. And Philemon, verse 16. Not now. And by the way, Philemon with... Onesimus, I, I encourage you sometime, read Philemon. Take Philemon's name out and put your name in it. And where he says to Philemon about how you, he is to be with Onesimus, coming back to him, put somebody in it you don't like as Onesimus. And see how Paul tells you to deal with the guy you're having the issue with. It's awfully interesting when you do it like that. Look at verse 16. Paul's talking to, uh, to Philemon about coming back. Not now as a servant. So when Philemon comes back, he's no longer a servant. But above a servant, a brother beloved. Especially to me. But how much more unto thee? Now watch. Both in the flesh and in the Lord. Look at that. Paul looks at Philemon and says, man, when Onesimus comes back, because I'm sending him, actually Onesimus has the letter to Philemon, and I could, I could just see Onesimus ring the doorbell, and he's like this. Oh, please just don't shoot me, don't shoot me. <laughs> you know? And you know what Paul says? Onesimus is now not a servant, he's a brother beloved. Not, so you need to raise him up as who he is in Christ, but also... In, Flesh right now in time, but also as who is in the Lord. That's how it's to work. You are to take who you are in Christ and deal with one another as who we are in Christ. Yes, we have the flesh. Yes, that ugly dude sticks his head up and you got to do the little whopper and whop him. But when you do that, you have to have the proper flow going. It's the only way to have success. Now, next time we'll talk about the conflict because there is a conflict that's going on. But what I wanted you to see this morning is, is hey, <laughs> Paul talks about the body, talks about the flesh. Context is going to tell you what it is. And man, when I tell you what, when you get down to it, you and I have been set free from the guy. We still have him because we're still in this body of sin, this vile body. We're still there, okay? But we have victory over him and who we are in Christ. And what you and I need to do is believe the verses and let the verses be the, 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 the motivating factor. And when you do that, guess what happens? He turns. He becomes a vehicle for good works rather than a vehicle for, for opposition. Okay? You follow? I hope you follow that. I, please, because it's a... This guy is the one that when I started the stuff and I, that first five minutes of that first lesson, this is where this is, some of that's come in. Because sometimes what happens is, is people say flesh and they're instantly in one category. And I'm telling you, you can't be in one category. You better be careful where you're standing. And oh, by the way, when you are standing in that sin nature category, you better read the verses and believe the verses. And they say you're set free from it. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live righteously and soberly in this present world. And that's, that the grace of God teaches us that. That's where we're to be. Okay? All right? All about having victory. All about having some understanding of how you work and how things move in and move out. Okay? All right. I thank you for your patience this morning. I really do. Because I, we got to, this is lesson six. And we got to keep going, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction here. And Lord, I just pray that we'll be careful about the old sin nature, to keep him where he belongs, which is crucified. Keep him and have who we are in you be what is running and ruling and reigning in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.